So, um, as far as this dreaded disease is concerned, Steven Johnson syndrome and 10 or toxic epidermolysis and uh, the bullosa or toxic epider ep epidermic necrotizing is all the same. It's all continuous spectrum of the same. It's also called by various other names. Uh, erythema multiforme major, Lyle's disease, toxic epidermal necrolysis. So these are some of the names that are bandied about for essentially the same disease. It's an acute onset of inflammation involving two or more mucosal surfaces. So before you call it an SJS or Steven Johnson, it must involve not only the eye but some other part. Usually it involves the mucous membranes of the mouth and sometimes the entire gastric tract. Sometimes the skin is also involved. Ten, ten is the most severe form of this. It resembles a thermal injury, almost scalding, as if all the skin is burnt off. There is a, a etiology, there is, it's not 100%. It's postulated there is a genetic predisposition why some people will get this with a single tablet of norfloxacin or while others will not get this. So it's triggered by various drugs like sulfonamides, norfloxacin, NSAIDs, various drugs have been found. But there are many patients who get exactly the same symptoms and signs without having taken any drug. So at that time maybe it's virus, maybe it's genetic, so we don't really know. What we do know is that it's a type 3 hypersensitivity reaction. IgA-mediated necrotizing vas vasculitis occurs with deposition of immune complexes. Abnormal T-cell response, impaired antigen presentation, alteration in cytokine production by subsets of inflammatory cells. So basically, it's a typical type 3 hypersensitivity. In the acute phase, you get a diffuse, non-specific non inflammatory response with membranous and pseudomembranous conjunctivitis. There is not much to choose from between membranous and pseudomembranous. It's said that if you peel off the membrane and there is bleeding, it's membranous. If there is not, it's not. But it doesn't matter. The treatment is the same. In the chronic stage of uh, SJS, the goblet cells now start showing a marked decrease, while the basal conjunctival epithelial cells proliferate. So you, you know that you get normal epithelium and goblet in equal ratio in the conjunctiva. Goblet cells will now decrease and regular epithelial cells proliferate. Then they get into squamous metaplasia. You get conjunctivalization of the cornea and you get that typical dry, lusterless look at the end. So what are the sequelae? You get recurrent and prolonged. I don't think this is really helping me here. You get recurrent and prolonged inflammation. Simblephra can occur. Entropion with trichiasis of the eyelashes keep going in. Posterior lead margin keratinization can occur. Lag of thalmos, persistent epithelial defects, a severe dysfunctional tear syndrome or DTS. And uh, lastly, you can of course get complete limbal stem cell failure leading to neovascularization, conjunctivalization and keratinization of the cornea. The management I would devise into the management of the acute phase if you have been lucky enough or the patient has been lucky enough that an ophthalmologist has been called in. Because many times these patients go first to the intensive care units because their life is threatened. The uh, doctors in charge will withdraw the offending drug if it's known. They will institute life-saving measures and only then if, if they, they uh, bother to look at the eye will they call you in. Many times it's too late. The eyes are already showing signs of melt of the cornea, melt of, of the conjunctiva, and it's very late. But if they do call you in early, then of course you need to discuss with the intensivist who's looking after that there has to be very aggressive um, management of infection, both by systemic route and, as well as by topical route, because the eyes, the resistance is so low that the chances of eye infections are very high. So uh, uh, these gentlemen tried a successful treatment of Steven Johnson with steroid pulse therapy at the disease onset itself. They gave one gram methyl prednisolone daily for three to four days. But I tell you that you will have a tough time convincing the intensivist to allow you to give one gram methyl prednisolone daily like you do in an optic neuritis case because they are very worried that the patient will have a fulminant infection if you give them these steroids and the patient may lose the life. So it's a, 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 you need to discuss this with the intensivist before you will be successful as these Japanese gentlemen were in doing this. When they did this, they found the results were dramatically better. 
Use of amniotic membrane, as Dr. Namrata Sharma talked about in chemical burns, just imagine this to be fairly similar. So use of an amniotic membrane, either directly as she showed you in the video, as a biological bandage over the entire ocular surface. I've done this by taking the patient from the ICU uh, to the, the, with the ambu bag, with the respirator on, to the operating theater and using, doing it as fast as possible, so preferably glue and no sutures. You can do it within two weeks itself. The earlier you do this, the more you will tamp down the inflammatory process. Exactly, exactly the same way as you would do for an acute chemical burns uh, in the paper by Sridhar et al. from LV Prasad. So it suppresses the inflammation, promotes epithelization at the acute stage. As a result, it does tend to prevent psychiatrical complications at the chronic stage. I've, whenever I've been able to convince my ICU to allow me to do this, we've got away with good results. So it's most important to sensitize the ICU personnel to call the ophthalmologist in early. The good old treatments of topical anti ointments and passing of a glass rod and removing of pseudo membranes is still important. You can do this in the ICU itself. If there is no infection, please start on topical steroids to reduce the inflammatory process. Every case of Steven Johnson, you must put on topical steroids, but observe the patient uh, in, for signs of infection. In the chronic stage, you will manage mild chronic superficial keratopathy with long-term lubrication may be sufficient. In other cases which are more severe, a tarsorapy will help you. If there are keratinized plaques from the posterior margin, uh, you need to remove this with a mucous membrane grafting, which was very elegantly shown by Dr. Geeta Ayer et al. from Shankar Netralai. And I've taken a film, borrowed a film from her to show you. And an amniotic membrane graft can be done at the same sitting. But when you take out the mucous membrane, you uh, replace it with lip mucosa. Buccal mucosal membrane is used. At the same time, you may or may not want to scrape the epithelium and put an amnion, or you could do this uh, later on. So this is the mucous membrane graft. You see, you just evert the lid, use a bad Parker 15 number blade, go just at the edge of the, where the bibobin glands are, just cut this, or you can see the uh, 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 keratinization there, then open the mouth, take a generous piece of the buccal mucosa after having marked it, take it out thick, then trim it down, remove the orbicularis uh, oris muscle there, and simply suture one part, the, the part which is near the eyelashes is sutured in place with Vicryl and the rest of it is glued into place. This is really an eye-saving surgery. It's very simple and it's eye-saving because most of the keratinization and the non-healing defects on the epithelium occur because the keratinized upper lid surface is continuously rubbing against the cornea. So this is something that all of us should so subsequently, you can do limbal stem cell transplants, amniotic membrane, superficial keratectomy, removing the conjunctivalized or keratinized ocular surface. Again, very similar to chemical burns. And uh, another thing which helps is the gas permeable scleral contact lenses, which are those large scleral lenses, formerly called the Boston scleral lens. Then it was called Pros, and the name keeps on changing. But basically, these are 18 to 20 millimeter lenses, which don't touch the cornea which are which uh, uh, in which you put it's like a tea saucer tea cup and saucer is like a tea saucer you put saline in that and then patient wears it as a daily wear lens and the photophobia is much reduced and it gives a chance for the epithelium to heal ancillary measures you need to remove the tracheatic lashes if they are just tracheasis if there is some amount of entropion you need to correct that with oculoplastic surgery uh, there may be multiple interventions. You need to keep fighting for these patients. And keratoprosthesis may be considered as a last resort. If the uh, uh, tear surface is good, then you would do the Boston, scleral, Boston uh, keratoprosthesis, as Dr. Samar will discuss, and get away with it. If the tear uh, uh, production is not good, if it's a bone dry eye, then this Boston, scleral, uh, Boston keratoprosthesis will not work. And you will have to do either the Pintucci that I'm doing or the modified osteoodonto keratoprosthesis. To conclude, pulsed IV methyl prednisolone in the acute stage with topical steroids if there's no infection and an amniotic membrane graft in the acute phase, mucous membrane graft to be offered as soon as you see signs of keratinization of the posterior lid uh, layer, 
scleral lenses are a life saver to keep the cornea moist and lubricants in the chronic phase, aggressive management of ocular infections at all time, and a keratoprosthesis to restore vision as a last resort. Thank you so much for your attention.